Welcome back to a brand new video guys on the platformer series in the last episode we went ahead and made this super cool 2d mario platformer camera that follows the player as we move like so however today we're going to be taking care of the movement system so that we can't move forwards and backwards and the such In order to do this, let's go ahead and stop the game. We're going to go right over to Starter Player over here in the right on the Explorer. We're going to click on this little arrow to open it up. And we're also going to go down to Starter Player Scripts where you'll see our other local script is. From here, I want to name this local script to our camera. Simply because that is the script that takes care of our camera. And then we're going to go over to Starter Player Scripts. Click on the plus icon to the right of it. And we're going to add in another local script that I want to name Movement. Today we're going to be using a brand new service that you may or may not have heard of just yet called Context Action Service, which is going to handle user input by binding specific key actions to our key presses. But for now, I want to start up here at the top with some services. The first service we're going to need is Run Service, which if you don't know what we used it for in the last episode, it allows execution of code every single frame and is typically used for time-related scripting. So this local run service is going to be equal to game colon get service run service. Now run service and context action service are not container services like you'll see inside of the explorer. They are built in scripting services that we have to reference using the game get service function. Let's go down the line. We're also going to go ahead and get the context action service, which is going to be equal to game get service context action service. Which, as I mentioned earlier, it's going to handle the user input by binding specific actions to our key presses, which is like A, W, D, S, all the different keys on your keyboard. And while we're at it, let's also go ahead and get the player service, which is going to be equal to game colon get service player. This is this player service you'll see right here in the Explorer. And as you can see, it will hold my character as yours should be holding your character. If it's not, don't worry about it. It will probably do that as soon as you join the game. However, for now, that's all we need to do for these services over here. So let's go ahead, drop down a few lines. We're going to say local player will be equal to players.localPlayer. Every local script is going to run on each individual client, which is each individual player. So when we say players.localPlayer, this is the player that this script is going to be running on. After that, let's go ahead and get the character of the player, which will be equal to player.character or player.characteraddedweight. The reason why we do or player.character added weight is simply because the player joins before the character does. And since our script is inside the starter player scripts, this script is going to be running as soon as the player joins and not necessarily the character joining. If I were to play the game, you'll see I have my player in the player service. And this will hold my backpack, starter gear, player GUI, and my player scripts. Which you'll see our scripts inside of here along with a few other ones that Roblox automatically adds. However, if you open up the workspace and then go down to my character, this is going to be my avatar or my character inside of the game. As you can see here, it holds all of my body parts, it holds my humanoid, and it controls certain things such as the health and the animations. So you can think of it as sort of the body and the soul of your Roblox player. You have the soul, which is your player inside of the player service, and then your body, which is the actual avatar inside of the game. That's how I like to think of it. It's a little complicated sometimes, but it's good to know. Now we have the player and the character, it's probably also good that we also go ahead and get the humanoid, which is located inside of the character. And as I mentioned earlier, it helps with defining the health and the walk speed and such of the player. So this is going to be equal to character colon wait for child humanoid with a capital H. This is all the player's variables that we're going to need for this script. So we can go down a little bit. And now I want to create a Boolean, which is a true or false value that we're going to call jumping. And this is going to be equal to false for now. We're going to set this to true or false, whether or not the player is actively jumping in the moment a little later on. From then, I want to create two new values for the left value and for the right value. For the left value, 
this is going to be equal to zero. And for the right value, this is going to be equal to zero. These are simply to track whether the player is pressing the left or right movement key. So a value of zero means that the key is released and a value of one is going to mean that it is not released, which means that it's pressed, which I'm going to get into and explain a little later on. That's all the variables we're going to need outside of our functions. So I'm going to drop down a few more lines here. We're going to create a brand new local function for our input. We're going to name this on input, and it's going to take the parameters of the action name, which is the action that we want to go ahead and perform. Then we'll to also add the input state, which is pretty self-explanatory, simply the state of the input that we want to go ahead and input into this function. From then we can press enter, and that will automatically place this end here at the end of our function. We're going to say if action name is equal equal to left, which means the player wants to go left, then we're going to change the left value. Pay attention here because it might get a little bit complicated. The left value will be equal to, that's will be parentheses, and then input state will be equal equal to enum dot user input state dot begin which if you read over here, it occurs when an input object starts to interact with the game. For example, a mouse button down or a key down or when a touch begins touching the screen, which means that whenever the player actually goes ahead and performs the action of left, which we'll take care of later on, we're going to begin the user input state, which means that the key is currently being pressed. And we want to say and one or zero. Whenever the left movement key is pressed, which will be right here, then we're going to set the left value to one. Otherwise, when it's released, we're going to set it back to zero. Now we're pretty much going to do the exact same thing for the right value. So we're going to say else if for uh, action name equals equals to right with an H, then right value will be equal to parentheses input state, which will be equal equal to enum dot user input state dot begin once again and one or zero. Similarly, again, when the right movement key is pressed, we're going to go ahead and set the right value to one. Otherwise, when it's released, we're going to set it down to zero. Next, we're going to say else if action name equals equals to jump. Then we're going to set jumping, which will be equal to parentheses input state, which will be equal to enum dot user input state dot begin which will set jumping to true when the jump key is pressed and false when it is released. Let's go ahead and drop down this function since we are completely done with that one. And now we want to go ahead and update the movement using a brand new function. So let's go ahead and create a brand new local function, which we're going to call on update. So let's go ahead and press enter after this function. Now let's go ahead and check if jumping and humanoid colon get state with parentheses, this get state function is going to return the humanoid's current enum dot user input state type, which depending on the activity that the humanoid is currently doing is going to return that activity. For this instance, it is jumping. Otherwise, it might be swimming, might be whatever other input that we set it to does not equal to enum dot humanoid state type dot jumping. Then we're set humanoid dot jump equal to true, which is going to make the humanoid jump if they're not already jumping as we see right here. So how is it going to work is that whenever the action type jump is called, so whenever the player presses the jump button, it's going to change the jumping value to the input state they want to be at, whether true or false. And it's going to check if jumping and the humanoid get state does not equal to jumping, which means that the value is set to jumping, but the player is not yet jumping. Then we're going to make sure that humanoid jumps whenever that state becomes true. That will take care of the jumping aspect. However, there's still the movement aspect that we need to take care of. So we're gonna say local move direction will be equal to right value minus the left value. And then we're gonna say humanoid colon move, which is going to move the humanoid in a specific position. We're going to say vector three dot new. We're going to do the move direction on the x axis because that is the left and right axes that we're going to be moving forward across. And we can put zero on the y and zero on the z as we do not want the player to move forward, backwards, or up and down unless they're jumping. So this local move direction variable computes the movement direction. So based on whatever these values are up here, is either going to be one, negative one, or it's going to be zero. 
one will be moved to the right, negative one will be moved to the left, and zero, which will mean no movement. Otherwise, both keys are being pressed at the same time, which will also result in the no movement aspect. This is going to give us which direction to move into, and then this actual move function right here is going to move the character left or right based on the right direction. And then let's go right outside this pair of parentheses right here, we're going to put a comma right there and we're going to say false. This false parameter that we're using right here is the relative to camera property, which means that this was set to true. The direction will be relative to the C frame of the camera. But if we put it to false, it will be relative to the world instead of the camera, which is what we want since the camera is going to be following the player, not necessarily the player following the camera or any other way. So we have our on input function and we have our on update function. Now it's time to go ahead and call these functions whenever we need to, to make sure that the code actually gets across how we want to. So let's drop down a few lines. We're going to say context action service colon bind action. Let's go ahead and give an action name as a string. So let's go ahead and put some quotation marks. Let's start off with left first. This is the first one we have right up here. Then we need to go ahead and give it a function to bind to this action, which in this case is going to be our on input function that we just created. After that, we want to create a touch button, which is going to be a true or false value. So this will be for touch devices, such as a phone, iPad, something of that sort. So we're going to go ahead and set this to true if you want mobile optimization. Otherwise, you can set this to false if you would not like that. And after that, we need to go ahead and give the different types of keys we want for moving to the left. For me, I'm going to do the A key, for example, which is typically the key that's used to move to the left on the keyboard. Then we're going to do enum.keycode.left right here, which will be the left arrow key in case the player is using that instead of A. And then we also want to say enum.keycode.dpad left, which is the left arrow on a gamepad D-pad, which will help if you're making this game for any controller players at all. But that's all we need to do for the left action. Now all we need to do is go ahead and repeat that for the right action. So let's go ahead and set the bind action right, colon, or on, oh, sorry, comma, on input function as the function to bind to this action. We want to create a touch button for this one. Then we want to go ahead and create our, once again, nut letters that we want to be pressed, or key binds, I should say, that we want to be pressed in order to trigger this action. So let's go ahead and do D for right. We're going to do comma and then enum.keycode.right this time instead of left, which would be the right arrow key. Then we want to do enum.keycode.dpad right. Right there. And that's all we need to do for the right button. And then last but very not least, we need to go ahead and do the same exact thing for the jump. So let's go ahead and do context action service colon bind action. We're going to do quotation marks, jump as the name. We're going to do the function to bind, which is going to be our on input function. We're going to create a touch button for the jump. And once again, we simply need to set our key binds. We want to be able to bind this action to. So W will be for up since space is already the jump key. Let's also go ahead and do enum.keycode.space, which will just make sure that the space key will be able to jump. And then we can also do enum.keycode.up, which is the up arrow key. And for the last but not least, we're going to do enum.keycode.dpad up. That's all we need to do for our jump action. So we can go ahead and leave that how it is. Now we have our left, right, and jump. And there is one more thing that we need to go ahead and do. And that one more thing that we have to do is drop down a line real quick. We're going to say run service colon bind to render step. And then inside of here, let's go ahead and give this a name, which we're going to call control because it's going to handle the controls of our player. Let's go ahead and then give it a priority, which we're going to set to enum.renderPriority.input.value. This render priority is simply going to be the priority at which things are rendered. So we want this to be at the same type of render priority as any other input would be. So we're going to go ahead and set that to the input value and the render priority list. I'm going to put a comma and then we're going to call the function we want to bind to this function right here. So we're going to call our on update function, which is going to handle the movement and the jumping. So this bind to render step function right here, it's going to bind the on update function to the rendering loop, which is going to ensure that the on update function right here 
is called every frame to make sure that we process the player's movements and jumps. And then once again, with this enum .render per to input to value, it's going to ensure that this runs after the input is captured, but before any other update that could be made to this script or before any other update comes, which could be a different type of render priority coming first. And if I'm not mistaken, that is everything that we need to do for this script. So I think the last thing that we need to do is go ahead and press this big blue play button. Let's go ahead and do so going into our game. And the first thing you'll notice if we try and press W, we will simply jump instead of going forwards. If we press the S key, we will not go backwards. However, if we press D, we'll move to the right. If we move A, we'll move to the left. If we press space, you can see we'll also jump. So W and space will do the exact same thing. If I press the left arrow key, I'll move to the left. If I press the right arrow key, I'll move to the right. So our user input is working perfectly fine. The one thing that is not working fine is that this camera is way too close to our player. So let's go ahead and update that. Let's go ahead and press this stop button right up here. Go back to our camera script this time. Let's go ahead and update these camera variables right over here. For instance, I'm going to change the camera Y to probably 5 instead of 10. And the camera Z, I'm going to move over to 20 instead of 10. Let's go ahead and press play and see how this works better for our player. As you can see, this is much more of a on-point camera. I might move the Y up a little bit to get slightly on top of the player. So I'm going to go to our camera script, change this to probably 7.5. I think that the camera Z is currently pretty good. Let's see it at 25 though and see if we like it. This is completely adjustable so you can move it according to your liking. I personally think that this is perfect so I'm going to keep it how it is. We're going to go ahead and take care of sprinting and crouching in another episode. But I think that this is going to handle our basic movement for today. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you enjoyed this tutorial just as much as I did, please make sure you like, subscribe, and comment down below. And I will see you in the next episode. Have a fantastic day. Goodbye.